We're going to turn our attention today to New Mexico, where Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, as you know, tried to ban carry in all respects in Albuquerque and related areas and was enjoined from doing so. After getting spanked by a federal judge, she went back and modified her emergency public order to deny people the ability to carry guns in parks and playgrounds, hoping that she'd get a favorable ruling from basically a liberal judge. She accomplished that, but the judge did not do good. You're going to see why. It's going to be obvious when we come back. Stay tuned. Hey, folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of Disarmed, What the Ukraine War Teaches Americans About the Right to Bear Arms, a lesson that the Israelis apparently did not learn by failing to arm their own citizens. Uh, we'll talk about that in a future video. Okay, folks. So, we the Patriots versus Michelle Lujan Grisham. As you know, down there in New Mexico, the governor decided that she was a king and just said that there'd be no carrying guns anywhere in, Albu anywhere in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, waved her magic wand, thought she could get away with it, and she got terribly spanked by a federal district judge out there, Judge David Herrera uh, Urias, uh, appointed by a Democratic president of the federal bench. Uh, he said that obviously that executive order that says no carrying of open or concealed or otherwise, even with a license, uh, that was entirely unconstitutional in light of Nice Server versus Bruin and the U.S. Supreme Court clear precedent on this point. So Governor Grisham goes back and says, well, look, I've got a liberal judge. I'm in New Mexico after all. New Mexico is a liberal state. It shouldn't be. There's plenty of rural areas. But nevertheless, the city of Albuquerque holds great sway and, you know, sends Democratic senators to Congress. So nevertheless, uh, as you know, she goes out there and says, hey, you know, I've got some good liberal judges out here in New Mexico. I should be able to win this. I just got to modify my order. And that's exactly what she did. She went from saying no carrying whatsoever of firearms in Albuquerque in the related county. Uh, she goes to say, well, no, I'm just going to narrow it down and say no one's allowed to bring a gun into public parks or playgrounds. And I'm going to try to defend that. Well, she did, and she won. The judge basically denied uh, the motion for a preliminary injunction. The plaintiffs, including we the Patriots and relevant plaintiffs, uh, sought a preliminary injunction, TRO, than an injunction uh, on the grounds that it was still unconstitutional for the government to come out and say that you cannot, that you can ban guns in parks and playgrounds, and that was not consistent with the Second Amendment. That is obviously the case that uh, bans on guns in parks and playgrounds are clearly unconstitutional under the proper analysis of the Second Amendment. We'll get to that in just a moment. Nevertheless, the judge basically said, nope, I agree with the governor. You can ban guns under the Second Amendment in parks and playgrounds. And we'll point out his uh, you know, mistakes in just a moment. But I will start off with saying this right off the top. It is clear that this judge, Judge Urias, did not take uh, his 23-page opinion seriously. There are some glaring mistakes, as I see it, uh, that a routine review of the draft opinion should have been caught, should have been caught by someone, whether it be by the judge himself or perhaps by one of his law clerks. Hard to say who's reviewing his work product. Uh, it all varies from chamber to chamber and judge to judge. But I'm just going to give you two obvious glaring mistakes to really show what I think is a sloppily written, sloppily reasoned opinion. And I think you will agree, and I think even the anti-gunners will agree uh, when I point out these errors, and then we'll break it down in greater detail. To begin with, if you take a look on page 16 of Judge Urias' opinion, he specifically talks about how he is going to go along with the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals decision in a case called the National Rifle Association versus Bondi. This is an 11th Circuit decision from 2023. He cites favorably a three-judge panel for the proposition that the relevant time period is the late 19th century for interpreting the 1791 Second Amendment, right? Right? But nevertheless, here's the thing. The reason why this is a terrible mistake, aside from the actual logic of it, is more fundamental than that. He cites to the 11th Circuit decision of NRA versus Bondi to say, see, the Court of Appeals said I got to look to the late 19th century when I interpret the Second Amendment. Well, guess what he failed to mention? Something that's kind of significant. That is 
that in the year of our Lord, 2023, on July 14th, Bastille Day, guess what? The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals took that three-judge panel decision that Judge Urias is relying upon and granted on banc review. Ming, 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 ming. You know what that means? It means the 11th, the entire 11th Circuit took a look at that three-judge panel decision that looked to the late 19th century and said, eh, eh, eh. no, 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 no gan go. This is clearly wrong and has granted on banc review. Now, where's the mistake? Well, the first thing is Judge Urias today in October 2023 is relying on a case that is clearly in question. Number one. Number two is on page 16 of this, is there any indication in his opinion that the 11th Circuit has on banc or granted on banc review of NRA versus Bondi? No. Uh oh, oh. Whenever a case is going to be reviewed on banc or certs granted in the Supreme Court, you always, 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 if you're a good lawyer, good judge, you always indicate that in your legal writing. You're flagging to people that you're signed to a decision that is likely or very likely going to be changed in some material way. So be very careful that you're relying upon it. Did Judge Urias do that here on page 16? No, he did not. This is a major, major uh, premise of his entire argument that the late 19th century is the relevant time period to look for historical analog laws. Nevertheless, he clearly cites it wrong. He misses the point. And it's clearly questionable, and it's almost certainly going to be reversed. So he's relying on what is something that is likely bad, bad law. No, no, no. Uh, this is a big no-no. Big no-no in the law. Nevertheless, that's what he does on page 16. So that's the first evidence that there's a big problem with his opinion. The other obvious mistake, and then again, we'll break it down in a little bit more detail, is on page 19. Tell me if there's something wrong with a sentence. Quote, Defendants also request that the court preliminarily enjoin the defendants from enforcing the second amended public health orders. Temporary firearm restrictions on playgrounds and so on. Hear what I just said? Defendants also request that the court preliminarily enjoin the defendants. Mistake. What he's trying to say here is the plaintiffs also request that the court preliminary enjoin the defendants, but he can't even write the sentence correctly. This is telling me that whoever's working on this opinion, whether it be Judge Urias by himself or his staff, I have no idea, don't know, but whoever is working in that office, whether it be Judge Urias or other people, is not being careful. This is clear evidence, clear evidence of sloppy work. Sloppy work. So if you can't get this kind of stuff right, what chance do you have that you're going to get the constitutional analysis right? The answer is the chances are not very high. So let us carry on. What else, in addition to those two blatant flagrant errors made by the judge that I, in my view, were uh, done? Well, of course, as you know, it's very basic how you do the Second Amendment work under Heller and Bruin. Again, you start with the text of the Second Amendment. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Here you have a modern-day gun law or gun regulation that says you cannot carry guns in public parks or on playgrounds. That clearly is touching fingers with or implicating the text of the right of the people to keep and bear arms because you're preventing someone from carrying, i.e. to bear arms, in a public park and, and, and or in a playground. So the text is implicated. This means that the burden shifts. The burden shifts. Repeat what I just said. The burden shifts to the government. In this case, uh, the governor of New Mexico, the burden is on the governor, not on the plaintiffs, but on the governor to come forth with historical analog laws to show at the relevant time period, there's a longstanding tradition of banning guns in public parks and playgrounds. Well, obviously, neither of this is possibly true. So how did the judge, Judge Urias, somehow conclude and say that the plaintiffs failed to satisfy their burden to show they're likely to win that these laws are unconstitutional? Well, the first thing the judge did is he immediately goes and says, I'm going to embrace the notion that the late 19th century, that's the time period of 
you know, 18... 68 through the 20th century is the relevant time period for trying to figure out the understanding of the 1791 Second Amendment, even though the Supreme Court never does it. That's right. So Judge Urea says, well, I'm going to look at late 19th century law because I want to see if you know once the text is implicated, the burden shifts to the government and the, their burden is to come forth with historical analog laws to show there's a long-standing tradition leading up to the modern-day gun control law to connect that all together as a matter of history. So the question is, what history is relevant? Well, we know the answer. The answer is you start when the Second Amendment was adopted in 1791 and you ask yourself, what did the seven, what did the Second Amendment mean? Were there historical analog laws in 1791 that restricted the ability to use firearms in some particular way that the Founding Fathers who wrote the Second Amendment and the people that ratified the Second Amendment would approve of? And then it is possible, and this is where the confusion comes in, it is possible that post-Civil War, post-14th Amendment adoption, which was adopted in 1868, it's possible that that time period can be relevant, can be relevant to the meaning of the Second Amendment. But in only one possible way can it be relevant. That is that the late 19th century history can confirm or affirm the 1791 understanding of it. It cannot contradict. You cannot use late 19th century historical laws to undercut or contradict the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment. This is basic black letter law. We see this repeatedly from the U.S. Supreme Court. My article in the Harvard Journal of Public Policy makes this clear repeatedly. All the different types of cases touch it on the Second Amendment, not just the Second Amendment, but all the Bill of Rights that you always look to 1791. The most recent example that's pretty well established is Espinoza versus Montana, where the, the Supreme Court rejected late 19th century law, i.e. 30 state laws that that were on the books uh, that arguably undercut and shrunk the scope of the religious clauses of the First Amendment, and the Supreme Court said, no, 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 those laws are too late. You can only use the 19th century historical analogs to confirm the 1791 understanding of the Bill of Rights, not to undercut it. That is a basic rule. Uh, everyone understands this. Of course, there is that language against scholarly debates, but the scholarly debate does not dictate who wins or loses Second Amendment cases. And what does the Supreme Court actually do? And if you look at what the Supreme Court actually does over and over and over and over and over again without exception, as I point out in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, they always look to 1791 for the relevant history of the Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, notwithstanding the fact that the 14th Amendment allowed the Bill of Rights to apply to the states. But remember, all the 14th Amendment did is you took the 1791 understanding of the Second Amendment and you applied it to a new group of people. You applied it to the freed African-American slaves. They now had the benefits of the Bill of Rights and you also applied it to a group of government agencies that could no longer infringe upon those rights. That would be the states. But the fundamental scope of the right is always understood to be the same as applied to the federal government in 1791 as applied to the states in 1868. It's always understood there's a single Bill of Rights. There's not a single Second Amendment for the federal government and a different Second Amendment for the states. There's no argument that there's a First Amendment for the federal government and a different First Amendment that applies to the states. That is never, ever done by the Supreme Court. Nevertheless, Judge Urias doesn't, just skips over all of this analysis and just willy-nilly embraces the late 19th century because that's good for the government. It's good for gun control. And that's why he does it. And he cites to a bunch of late 19th century stuff. But then he goes on to say, well, there's these rules about parks. Uh, but of course, he doesn't talk about the how and the why. Specifically, why were there rules involving parks? Did it involve hunting or any, poaching or any of these things? Uh, nevertheless, that is exactly what he did. But he was in the wrong time period. There are no restrictions on guns and parks at 1791. That means that there's no way that the government can win these park cases, number one. But then he goes on and talks about how, uh, you know, well, playgrounds are like schools. And the Heller case is a reference to, we don't, we're not worried about, you know, in, in, we're not intending to knock out sensitive places or rules involving, you know, guns in sensitive places such as schools. That was just an illustration in the context of dicta. But then if you look at the Bruin case, they really only identify three examples of sensitive places that are relevant. One is polling places. The second one is uh, um, legislative chambers. And third is courthouses. Now, here's the key. Listen very carefully about this because the anti-gunners try to play this game with schools 
And then they try to say school, school, schools are sensitive places, which is a euphemism for gun-free zones. Government get into gun-free zones. Okay, let's be very clear. If you look at the founding era history involving guns not permitted at schools, be very careful about this. Be very clear. Ready? The laws and rules they're talking about pertained to only students. 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 There were restrictions on college students carrying guns on college campuses at the time of the founding. The reason why that was the case, though, is at the time of the founding, unlike today, at the time of the founding, a lot of the students that were going to colleges were like 15, 14, 16 years of age. They were kids, and the school stood um, basically in the role of parents over these essentially children on these college campuses. But here's the key point. None of these founding era rules or regulations or bans involving no guns on campus, no guns at college, none of these restricted in any respect the ability of non-students to carry guns on campus. None of them respect, respected the ability or banned a professor, a teacher from having a gun on campus, or an administrator, or a member of the public. These are only restrictions at the time of the founding on students. And frankly, the reason why you had these restrictions on students was because, again, at that time, they were very, very young kids going to college, unlike today, where you might have a 28-year-old at college and things like that. Um, no, back then, it was really, again, uh, young kids, almost children, if you will, on these college campuses. But again, this kind of analysis that I just articulated was not done by Judge Urias. He just simply says, well, you know, it says, generally speaking, you can't have guns, or the Supreme Court in Heller made a reference that we're not really striking down laws about no guns in schools. We're not going to get into that. And then he says, well, then schools deal with vulnerable people, and that's kind of analogous to playgrounds where you have vulnerable people, but that's all total BS. There's no historical basis for any of this. If you actually look at the history, you can only say, well, students can't have guns on campus. And by extension, you could say, well, maybe children can't have guns on playgrounds. Well, yeah, that's a no duh. I think that's kind of understood. Uh, but again, it has nothing to do with the adults and the non students and the non children. Nevertheless, do we see that kind of, you know, serious legal reasoning, that sort of intellectual logical connections that one would expect from an Article III federal judge with lifetime? tenure with a lifetime appointment, you know, nominated by the president of the United States, confirmed by the U.S. Senate? Do we see this kind of intellectual neurons firing in the mind as expressed in his opinion by Judge Urias? Nah, absolutely not. None of this kind of intellectual rigor that I would expect from my students, that I would expect from my associates, that I would expect from my lawyers, and I would expect from serious scholars and serious people, including serious federal judges, none of that we find in Judge Urias' opinion. Uh, again, I think he earnestly threw down a bunch of words. Uh, he ruled in favor of the government, which I'm sure he wants to do. I'm sure he has no interest in private gun ownership, is my guess. And he did the right thing for his team, if you will, but certainly intellectual rigor and seriousness. Uh, no, no, he mouthed the right words, but as you can see, made lots of mistakes. Uh, I'm not shocked by this, uh, given the fact they're in New Mexico. And this is a, a judge appointed by a Democratic president, uh, given the nature of this case. Not shocked by this result. We'll see what the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals does, which is the Court of Appeals that oversees New Mexico. But anyway, that's where we are. Okay, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today about the um, New Mexico situation. We'll keep following this case. If you haven't subscribed to us, please do so here at the Four Boxes Diner. Don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner. And again, we'll see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Order is up. Table 2A.